So an abstraction is the idea of hiding implementation details, hiding complexity, hiding the nature of how things actually work behind some sort of an interface, behind some sort of a project, behind some sort of a product, a component, anything, a language that essentially simplifies the communication between you as a client, as a developer, as a user, as a user experience user, right? As an engineer dealing with this thing, you deal with an interface instead of the actual implementation. So the naive uh, explanation we've been doing for many years in object orientation is this is not a dog, this is not a cat, this is not a sloth, this is not a snake, you just deal with a pet and if you want to make this pet makes some noise or you want to pet them or just play with them then you don't care about how the implementation of how a dog sounds like versus how a cat sounds like versus how a snake sounds like who had uh, pets as snakes that's just a terrible example right and and uh, how sloth sounds like these are different implementations so you and we've been told so many times by so many like the designers like okay always program to an interface not to an actual implementation or program to an uh to, to high don't don't work with concrete classes work with interfaces all the time right so we that's where we've been told so we're working with this pet class and and it hides it abstracts away the complexity of the back end. Obviously, this is a very uh, simple example, but let's take it to an actual world where an abstraction could be the TCP stack, the, uh, the transmission control uh, protocol, right? And then uh, it it gives you the abstraction of an of a reliable connection, but there is complexity on the back end that you have no idea about. And there is let's go back and a little bit step further. HTTP two gives you an idea of multiplexing streams and gives you allowing them to send multiple requests on the same beautiful TCP connection right uh, multiplexing very beautiful idea HTTP let's move on up SQL language the actual SQL syntax is an abstraction if you know that your stinking select star from employee if you just know how much work the database is doing for your select star from employee you will really appreciate that beautiful abstraction and just hide so much complexity instead of going to fetch go through a structure that is indexed and then search the index traverse a b tree get them tuples go back to find where the pages for these tuple look like go to the actual page pull those pages from the heap and then look through this there's so much stuff that is going on there okay just to satisfy your so stick one language is another abstraction another abstraction is orms right people love this stuff object relational mappings right? i don't care about sql because i it's very hard to learn i just want to deal with objects hey uh, give me all products product dot all give me all of that and then for each product give me the price the productive price and that's it so it abstracts away even the complexity of SQL language, right? But there's someone named Joel Spolsky, brilliant, brilliant engineer that came up with a, with a coined, he coined a term called leaky abstraction. And that's the topic of today. That was a long intro. How about we jump into it? <laughs> Guys, this is the Back in Engineering Show with your host, Hussein Nasser. And uh, today's topic is leaky abstractions. And... I've been running into this leaky abstraction concept in my career, but I didn't know it had a name. And it always bugged me that when I work, uh, when I work with a Postgres versus SQL Server versus Oracle versus DB2, I always hated that my application needed to understand the concrete implementation behind DB2 SQL syntax versus SQL Server, SQL Syntax versus Oracle, uh, to date, oh, the dates in Oracle are the best, aren't they, huh? And uh, yeah, I always like hated that stuff. And this is one example of a leaky abstraction. An abstraction gives you, the goal of an abstraction gives you um, uh, the power that you don't have to ask anything about the backend implementation details. 
That's the goal of an abstraction. If you started asking, hey, why is this happening? Why am I getting an error? Why this is slow, right? When you start asking any of these questions or more, then you essentially dealing with a leaky abstraction. The moment you start working with something, why this is bloated, why there's so many JavaScript files and CSS files, you're you get essentially why the CSS file is so large, why the JavaScript file is so large. Once you start dealing into this, that's part of the abstraction. That's essentially one one side effect of frameworks, right? Framework, frameworks are also abstractions, but the moment you start leaking those abstraction details, leaking those details back to you as a user, you have a leaky abstractions. Leaky abstractions are really nasty. All right, here's some examples of leaky abstractions. Very few that I collected from uh, Joel, and uh, some of them are from me. I um, personally observed them. So the SQL language is one abstraction, right? We have seen countless queries that are look identical. You execute it on one, one, one database, it gives you certain performance result. You move to another database, you execute that same exact SQL, you get a completely different performance. And as a result, the abstract, if you have using some sort of these uh, apps that kind of hides the complexity of the backend, the actual language, then you have introduced some leaky abstractions. I'm sure the language itself is leaky because you cannot, the moment you start asking, oh, why this is slow, even forget about the different DBMSs, taking just Postgres, you can execute one query in Postgres at a given moment and wait for the transactions, the transactional system just to kind of settle down, ride itself, just work itself out. You execute it again, you get completely atrocious performance. Why? Because the way Postgres have the idea of did tuples and the need to vacuum and m m take another example with MySQL and the use the default use of clustering in MySQL in the primary key. If you used the wrong data type in as your primary key in MySQL especially something random like GUIDs or UUIDs, inserts might look great in the beginning, but as they pro uh, progress, inserts will be atrociously slow. So that's the same insert didn't change. All of a sudden, it is slow. Why? Because of the clustering needs of the GUIDs will basically are random or the UUID are random. So you don't know where, which page what you're going to fetch to insert that go it into that page especially in a cluster environment right it's not like you're in inserting always append nicely in the end clustering forces you to order up an insert and the whole tuples and the whole rows should be ordered based on that right the idea of having clustering together so it has to be clustered nice together it's not a big problem if it's sequential but as you go random you're pushing different pages from the desk and uh, the buffer the buffer pool will get filled very quickly and then every query every insert will eventually not use the buffer pool because everything that is in the buffer pool is essentially useless it's not gonna unless you're lucky you're not gonna hit that same nice page that you're always inserting to right so that kind of leaky abstraction as well so sql language is leaky because you always gonna ask yourself why this is slow why this is giving me an error why this is behaving this way why this is uh why this is even succeeding this is supposed to be error things like that yeah? so speaking of things that fail they're supposed to succeed another leaky abstraction is axios which is a library that allows you to make http requests and you make an http request and the, the server returns a 404, a lot of client libraries treat that as an error. But guess what? At the back end, that's not an error. That's an actual status code that says, hey, I could not find this. I did not fail, right? But I just returned 404. Yeah, I, I, you ask for something that just doesn't exist. It's not 
an error you can it's a philosophical question you can disagree with that but technically on the back end to us back in engineers that's not an error that's a legitimate thing that you asked for and i couldn't find technically i blame you it's a request error if you think about it right that's why it starts for 400 request uh, client errors are starts for 400 i believe that's that's the standard but 500 errors that's a server error right so axios essentially treat 404s as errors if you so if you have used fetch which is the native browser library that doesn't return an error right but if you used axios all of a sudden that throws an a javascript exception and people don't like that well some people don't care but some people says hey why is this throwing an error the moment you start asking why something is the way it is then the abstraction is leaky because you started asking why because you want to know the details and the moment you start knowing the details you just dive deep into the abstraction and when you dive deep into the abstraction implementation details might as well just write it yourself huh that's why i'll leave my opinion about this at the end but i'm going to give you more and more examples let's just let's just dump another example so we talked about sql language uh we talked about the uh, axios orms which sits on top of sql technically right object relational mapping there is a very infamous problem in orms that's called the n plus one problem graphql is infamous for that if you use orms on the back end i never deployed graphql server i believe you have to use some sort of our object relational mapping i might be wrong there alone no but if you do then you get the n plus one problem and n plus one problem is is essentially a leaky is the canonical example of leaky abstractions where where you can easily solve this with a single query that the idea of abstracting the sql language to objects such as hey products dot get all then uh for uh, products then get price right that translates to select star from products give you all the products and then you the get price will translate to oh give me the uh, select it will translate to give me the price of each product and that what that will do essentially because that's that that's the default implementation of orms is it will turn around and execute a query for each product to get the price right because that sits in another table and that will translate to many 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 queries right so a single statement in your programming language will translate to thousands of queries and you're gonna start asking question why this is slow why my graphql is slow well because it's leaky everything that is abstracted away if it's complex like graphql is gonna leak eventually and when you leak you start asking this question and next thing you're in youtube uh trying to understand why 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 your graphql is slow why your orms why your django is slow that's one reason because you don't understand what is it doing so i always cry on this channel guys assume every abstraction is leaky when you're dealing with it I, again i'm talking about myself here assume that everything is leaky and understand what you use understand what this thing is doing when you do you're gonna first of all appreciate the work behind the open source maintainer the people who build that library that you use that abstraction that protocol that standard and then th finally you'll become a better software engineer because hey you know how things work you can work around it you will build better application because of this right it's like even one single query could be rewritten in a single way in a certain way in postgres that gives you completely the same result but a completely different performance why because you understand how it works and you might argue with this or saying oh, that's not my job well i i have to agree with you at a certain time you can't understand everything like i drive a car every day i have no idea how it works right i know it's like there's some compulsion that just flames and just 
does magic. I don't know how it works. Yeah, you can laugh at me. I don't know how a car works, right? But airplane, I don't know how it works. I just, I travel. I hate traveling, but I travel on airplanes. I don't know how it works. But if it's my job, if I'm interfacing with this thing directly, if I'm back an engineer, I'm sorry, I have to understand that. I don't claim to understand everything. I try, right? But if I deal with Nginx, I gotta understand how Nginx works, how threading works in Nginx, how threading works in Envoy. Because you can use the things blindly, but that will give you, that will only gives you so far. Okay. Uh, another example, TCP. TCP. That's the example Joel gives. Uh, did I talk about Joel? I have. Joel is basically a genius, brilliant software engineer. Been in the Microsoft for a long time. Uh, been uh, the CEO of the uh, Stack Overflow, right? And he writes good books. He has this I nice ideas of leaky abstraction and the painter problem. I forgot what it's called. Um, w w very, very interesting site. His blog is very nice. I, li I like listening and uh, listening and watching and reading his work. So TCP is an example. The reliability of the uh, transmission secure protocol, the transmission control protocol that is given to the user. In this case, the user is think about it the HTTP client in this case, right? Or, or even if you're building a game that is using directly TCP, you are the user. You are given a promise that this is an abs uh, a reliable connection. You give me a message, I'll send your message directly. And I guarantee you the rise. Why? Why are things not guaranteed by default internet? Of course not. The IP protocols move layer three, because TCP is layer four, move a little bit down, layer three, it's just a blind best effort guarantee, right? But it's not even, I don't think it's a best ever. IP packets literally just have destination IP, source IP. It doesn't have ports or anything. It's like, hey, I'm going to deliver this packet to this machine. And then the higher layers will take care of uh, other stuff like ports and stuff, right? If If there are ports. Sometimes, like, there are no ports. ICMP, for example, there are no ports. So there, this is not guarantee. TCP builds guarantees on top of that, quote-unquote guarantees, by having the retransmission, by having a flow control, by building sequences, making TCP stateful, essentially, storing, physically storing in memory, values that correspond to the actual sequence message the sequence is left and right this will be stateful the, all this work and you send a message you send one message and then you send another message and the third message they look all identical the third message takes takes 400 milliseconds while the first two takes two milliseconds why why you asked why that's a leaky abstraction the moment you start asking why the moment you start seeing, asking, worrying about how, a, how how an abstraction like TCP works, it just leaked you information. When you leak, you got dove into an implementation. So my point is that always understand it. Assume every abstraction is leaky, and that's your understanding. The only abstraction that it, I didn't have to really worry about is hashing. Really, hashing is always big O of one to me. And and literally is just a black box i know how it works theoretically but i never needed to understand the actual implementation it just always consistently work it never leaks unless you got, or might have run into an example where hashing something actually leaked some abstraction details when you have you ever asked your question oh why did i when i generate a GUID, which is the GUID generated why is it slower than this time if you start asking this question, then you just leaked. Uh, the abstraction got leaked in this case. Uh, let's give an example. Are you sick of examples? No, I don't think you are. Uh, this one is what I personally coined, and uh, so it might be wrong. Well, this is not the first time I, I will be wrong, so what the hell, let's do it. HTTP2 is also a, a big, huge abstraction leaker. HTTP2 is a leaker. It leaks. We gotta bring a bucket and a mop for these leaky abstractions, man. 
So HTTP2 leaks to well, how we're saying how well it leaks by two methods. The problem when you send massive requests and later request get blocked and not received by the backend because earlier uh, requests have not completed yet because the stinking packet or a segment in this case because TCP have not reached its destination and when we don't reach that the TCP stack so you can bl blame TCP for that one if you think if you if you would like that the TCP stack will block all sequences below that number until that particular sequence that belongs to that logical request is arrived successfully and then it will unblock and you can essentially send, uh, deliver all these packets to you all of a sudden then the application layer 7 will assemble these hundred segments into 70 streams right whatever that's a lot of streams seven streams maybe and then these streams will be delivered to the application and then you you'll see the requ different requests so that's a head of line blocking the tcp head of line bro bro blocking blah 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 can't talk anymore uh quick solve that by using udp because tcp is a leaky abstraction we don't like this head of line blocking let's take care of our own flow control our own delivery retransmission at the at the layer four which which we have more control over i don't want you to blindly do that so this is a very good example quick is a great example where we got a leaky abstraction we understand why things are slow but we want to do something else so we broke the abstraction and we re-abstracted away as a, as a quick protocol. I'm pretty sure down the line we're gonna run into a Quick's own problem. Quick is not finalized yet. People are still working. Smart people are working on on finalizing Quick yet. So let's go back to HTTP2. HTTP2. Another leaky abstraction in HTTP2 is because um, something I just mentioned, right? All these TCP segments coming to the application all of a sudden. That doesn't mean anything to the client. These are just packets. These are not requests. Uh, in HTTP 1, you, you get a beautiful TCP segment or packet. This is one-to-one, -one, almost one-to-one, -one, a collection of packets, content, right? The TCP content becomes the application data immediately. There are no other funky stuff going on. So that's very one-to-one -one almost. You get the data immediately, you deliver it to the application. That's a request. Well, you, you find where the end of the request is by this hacky string manipulation that HTTP does. Like, okay, this is the start of the request. Get slash HTTP one, one, blah, blah, blah. And then this is the end. The end is like what? Is a slash n slash r. That's the end of the line. Uh, that's the end of the request. Yeah, but that's that's pretty much it. In HTTP two, nah, nah, nah. Nah, that's not what we do in HTTP2. HTTP2 will have this idea of streams. So we have technically the TCP segment that we sent contains our HTTP content, contains your GET request. But guess what? The HTTP2 client adds headers, adds stream information, adds magic streams, adds, what is it called? H pack compression it adds all this stuff that you have no idea that exists it is an abstraction but it's a leaky one you might say Hussein how well all of a sudden lucid chart actually ran into this uh they said hey http 2 fantastic let's turn off http they turned http 2 all the way on all their backend servers what happened cpu percentage usage 100% all of their servers like what the heck happened we literally didn't change anything well you actually did you changed a major protocol technically the client is not is not even a breaking change well it depends I'm gonna take that back it's a it's a breaking change in the lower level but the application didn't change. when you say when you make an axios or a fetch request you don't really care if it's http 2 or http 1. so from that point that's not a breaking change 
but, 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 but the client need to understand how to speak HTTP2. And you have been, if you're a web developer, you have been blessed by this thing that is called a browser that is basically is the biggest client library to you. And it basically take care of these complex abstractions. So HTTP2 is CPU hungry. Quick is CPU hungry. Why? Because we we get these packets delivered to the application and instead of prior to that stuff in HTTP 1.1, we just use it. We just straight up use that content. But now we have to do more work. We have to parse these packets to find the stream ID, to find all this other header information that HTTP2 has, and then wait for more packets to arrive. Oh, this seven packets is actually stream one, so go here, this is request number one. Oh, these other packets are stream three, so this is, okay, it goes stream three. So you have to wait for packets to arrive to and parse them. So there is an additional CPU overhead over that. And there is obviously the H back compression, decompression, all the header compression. There is the body compression, stuff like that. So there's, so there's work, there's work. And the, the work of HTTP2 uh, ma uh, makes the CPU essentially hungrier. And when the CPU becomes hungry and busier, you, see, you feel it. And all of a sudden, your performance becomes uh, atrocious as a result. I'm, I'm, am I saying HTTP2 is bad? No. It really depends on your use case, right? HTTP2 and Quick became better at managing this CPU usage, so we're better at that. But still, it's a leaky abstraction. And a final leaky abstraction example is um, uh, your API that you built, your backend API, uh, microservices. Let's take an example. Microservices, like, oh man, this is the leakiest abstraction of all. Oh, my God. People jumping in the strain that like there's no tomorrow. So when you make a call to a service in a microservice, you th think, hey, I'm just asking for the price of this product. But no, the price of the product is asking service A for the product info and service A is asking three services for oh, what is the average price, what is the bestseller price what was the price like 100, 100 days ago and then these query their databases and get results and sometimes it's old so queries another service for the actual uh, backup price and from you so you, you one request end up to be 100 requests at the end of the day easily this happened right as a microservice even you a click of a button that abstracts away in the user experience, that does something, you end up sending 700 HTTP requests for some reason. That's another leaky abstraction. You abstracted away that this is just a click of a button, but you, now you're making me ask questions. And the moment I ask questions, I need to know the details. You, you have to explain the details for me. Like, oh, why is this this way? Okay, if you want to understand, I'm going to explain it to you. Okay. Postgres, why is this? Uh, it says index only scan. It's supposed to be, a lot of people ask me this question, right? In my uh, introduction to database engineering, plug time. Introduction to database engineering, by the way, is my Udemy course, very popular, bestseller. Uh, I talk about database engineering there. So check it out, hussainasa.com slash courses, uh, over 14 hours worth of content. I talk about fundamentals, the fundamentals of business, because you're going to be mental if you don't have fun right? But there's fun in it. The fundamentals of business. The fundamentals of business. Mental is a part of the word. I have underlined it. Because your mental, if you don't have a good time, you have to enjoy it. You know, the, the fun is in it. <laughs> oh, fundamental. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Get out. I know. Yes, yeah, so... Yeah, so a lot of people ask me this question. There's this lecture that I put there. I talked about index scan in Postgres versus index only scan. But the mistake I made in this video was index only scan was actually slower than index scan, which is kind of contradictory to the point of the lecture I made. And people called me out on it and said, Hussein, 
You said index only scan is faster, but it's you showing that it's slow. I mean, when I showed it, the whole thing I'm, I'm showing is all moot because it's it's a, it's a toy data set. And when it's a toy data set, it's just like five millisecond versus 10 millisecond. Who cares, right? But the concept still applies. But the leaky abstractions here is you guys, the students ask this questions like, why is index only scan slower than index scan? And there was a good point. Why? Index only scan, again, this is another abstraction where, hey, I'm gonna only use the index, so I'm gonna give you a faster performance. But you did not give me faster performance. You give me slower. So now I started digging up. Okay, why is index only scan slower in this case? And then it took me a few seconds. Like, okay, that's why. So when I did explain, analyze on my query, there was a, there was a note from Postgres. Postgres say, yo, dude, what up, man? Uh, yeah, I understand you homie you want to query this table, but this table's uh, actually been edited, and my visibility map says that the pages you're looking for invisible. That's that's exactly what Postgres told me. So they aim visible. So I had I couldn't look up. I couldn't uh, I, I I couldn't assume they are visible. So I had to go to the heap to check if the tuples that you're asking for are are actually visible. Say, yeah, I promise you an index only scan, which by definition that is that means don't go to the heap and don't don't touch the heap. This expensive nasty heap right don't go there but i had to go homie because uh, i'm sorry your your pages have been edited someone have been touching this stuff and it was me i was the one editing it of course and you edit that stuff this this thing that's called vm which is a visibility map it's basically a, bl uh, a glorified uh, bloom filter in postgres that gives you the the it gives you, hey, it says all the rows in this page that you're about to query are visible. So you don't have to check if that if the, if the transaction actually can see this. This is MVC series on the multi-version concurrency control, right? Say, hey, I don't want to go to check that. It's just, let's assume they are good and then just, just return them to the user, right? And instead, because they are not visible, because I've been editing them. Actually, I'd never edited them. They are freshly inserted. All I had to do was run vacuum. If I run vacuum, vacuum will go through all the pages that are invisible, physically go to the rows, say, okay, are there any transactions that are still using those old rows? Can I mark these uh, rows are fully visible to all transactions. This is a very critical concept in, in, in MySQL and in all databases and Postgres. So that when you mark that page as all visible, the query planner will not require to hit the heap to check if a row is visible. Does that make sense? So that's another leaky abstraction, index only scans. How many leaky abstractions did I give you now? So many. Git is another example, Git interface. A lot of people said, hey, there's a thing, there's a beautiful um, X, XD, XDC uh, comic uh, that, <laughs> that explains this. Like, hey, use Git. It's like, it manages your source controls and all that stuff. Like, it uh, gives you history and you can push comments and you can go back and revert and roll back all this stuff. Oh, yeah, how do I use it? I don't know, just use this command line and, and whenever things go wrong, just back up your directory. <laughs> Then just restore it back. Because Git is the leakiest abstraction. Git interface. And it's a brilliant protocol behind it. Don't don't give me not genius design, right? But it's leaky as F, man. It is leaky. And when it's leaky, what you think Git push actually pushes things, but oh, Git push gives you an error because something I don't know, there's, there's someone else who pushed. Now you have to get pull, but you have some changes that are conflicting with that. It's not an easy interface. This is the worst interface that you're going to deal with, right? And whoever says that it is easy, uh, you, you, you're smart, smarter than me, essentially. <laughs> All right. So, guys, check out Joel's blog. 
on uh, Lee Kiep slash. And he goes into more details into like uh, more older stuff, you know, TCP and stuff. He's he's very low level. He's talking about C and low level TCP stuff. I try to kind of abstract it to uh, you. Abstract the abstraction, abstract the leaky abstraction to you, but apparently I'm leaky and stuff. Get it? No. Sorry. But yeah, essentially, uh, my goal is when I when I see into these things, when I deal with things interface directly, I always I always end up asking more questions, which end up I I end up understanding the tech I'm working with. Right. So I'm technically I'm just I'm assuming every abstraction is leaky. I'm just working with it. <laughs> it's like like when I work with Nginx, it behaved in a weird way. I had to read about uh, how threading is working in Nginx. Or I know about Postgres, it starts spinning like 300 processes. Like, what the heck? Why do we have 300 Postgres processes here? I had to learn more about Postgres and how their forks works and the shared memory. All this stuff. Pretty much everything, I assume, just is a leak abstraction and understand it as a result, right? This obviously doesn't scale, right? And that's why you have to ask people who have people who understand these pieces like you can't understand possibly everything but you try as much as possible uh, that's what i'm doing i'm trying to understand all this stuff but sometimes i fail sometimes i succeed all right guys uh that's it for me today that was leaky abstraction i'm gonna see you in the next one make sure to check out the other content on the channel on the podcast for all those listeners make sure to rate us on uh, i don't know who's us it's just me uh, rate me on the Apple Podcast. Give me five stars if you like it. Four and a half if you don't like it. One star if you absolutely hate it. I thank you so much. Love you. I'm going to see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome. Goodbye, y'all.